Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. It's good to be back. Well, this evening I'm talking about watches you can buy with your tax return, the best $3,000 watches, give or take. I'm ranking the best watch bracelets and telling you why all of that, and I am sharing your viewer wrist shots right here in Watchbox Studios on Watches Tonight. Edward Ledden, Blue Shirt Buddha, Watchusiest, Marco B, and Mr. No Date in the box already. Remember guys, open up a different window, keep me streaming, and check out thewatchbox.com. I have my favorites, that's why they're always featured in this promo, but we have conventional brands too if you like Tag Heuer, Omega, Breitling, Rolex, we got them all, and many more. 3,000 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now, many of them with videos by yours truly. I should also mention that you can visit me on Instagram if you want to see videos by yours truly, 1,500 of them in one minute formats. You can literally binge watch my Instagram account, and here's the best part. There are exclusives. There are actually watches on that Instagram that do not show up on thewatchbox.com, and it's often where I post the best of the best. So check me out, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. All right, we have a lot of friends. We have Pascal from Switzerland, Watches and Whiskey, Sean B from Temple, Texas, Butik One from Poland. We've got Adam Crossfire. We've got Mateo C. We've got Alex O and Dave Oppenkar, another Zin fan. We've got Wolfgang from Austria. And we've got Jim Millet, Mark S. from Brooklyn, Dr. Stu joining in, Turkish Meister from Turkey, Mr. Enigma, Boss Defender from Bavaria, Germany, Galvin Wong, and Shea Berger, 87, joining in from Texas Hill Country. All right, guys, I think it's worth mentioning a few things as you filter in, give you a little bit more time to join the show. And as you do, let me recall walking back from work today. I walked back from the office to get my car and the kids let out from school fairly early. So as I'm walking back, I'm standing at a corner. There's a crossing guard. There's like three kids and this Ferrari 550 in titanium gray goes gliding past. It had this lovely, almost fruity woofle from Tubi or Capristo modified exhaust. And it was that wonderful ripped canvas sound, but, but muted as it pulled away. And I was just like, oh, give me goosebumps. Kids, kids didn't notice a damn thing, just looking at their phones. Then this red wrapped E92 M3 with about 20 degrees of negative camber on rims goes roaring by with like muffler delete and resonators and it's this horrible blaring atonal thrash. The kids are all like, oh, a Ferrari! And that's when I realized, kid, someone's not going to be valedictorian. Life's going to be tough for you, kid. <laughs> Nothing against E92 M3s, but that ain't no Ferrari. Especially since they were consecutive at the same light. All right, let's take a look at the viewer wrist shots. I asked you answered. Your piece is on my pixels. Eric T. in his Alango Unzona 1815 annual calendar opens our evening of fun. We've got Tony G. sharing his newly arrived Debetun DB15 RT perpetual calendar moon face. Lovely, a classic, an early Debetun, and inevitably a watch we're all going to wish we bought when the time comes. Bradley G. in his Patek 5235G annual calendar regulator. Visit Carol Shelby's Patek Philippe 1463 chronograph, which he received after winning Le Mans in 1959 in an Aston Martin co-driven by Roy Salvadori, which assuredly was neither BMW or Ferrari. Raymond K. of Texas and his Geo 70s chronograph panorama date. Wow, that is impressive. And Marcus of Germany dazzles. Even more so with an Alango Unzona Saxonia Thin Copper Blue in White Gold. Guys, keep them coming. Send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com because someone always asks in the description below the video. Let's see what you guys are saying. Time Hill, a big fan of the 1815 Langa. We've got Brendan Cunningham saying fire on display in Texas right there. We have Ryan D saying nice starting with a longer wrist shot. We've got a friend joining in from Ontario, Canada and Jeffrey L. And Sean Hansen, hello everyone, hello Sean. Daniel B asking Omega Seamaster or Planet Ocean? Seamaster, and there's gonna be more of that, rest assured. We have Ryan D also liking the new duds right here. We've got a new jacket and let's see, Edward Ledden saying 550 Marinello, not my favorite Ferrari, but I do like my V12s. So that is my favorite Ferrari. And with a Capristo exhaust, my favorite car probably. And I'm not a Ferrari guy. Wachusiest saying, I love the, the 
M3 of that era, but it's no Ferrari. And I got to agree with you right there. Let's see who else is in the box. Randy Allen. We've got Shopla Qatar. Tim, when will the Zin project start? We got to wait for them to get past their anniversary year, unfortunately. This is their 60th anniversary, and they were clear the focus is going to be on that. But I'm looking at other brands like St. Galen, Oris, and maybe even Ball, who might be interested in doing our Facebook group, Tim Masso, limited edition watch. Uh, I think the will is there with Zinn, they just don't have the capacity. And then right here we have Luciano M saying Cancun says hello. And Edward Ledden reminding us that German cars are less than Italian cars. Maybe an emotion, but not overall. I think of them as separate, um, but great rivals, equal in some ways. Okay, now let's take a look at the best luxury watch bracelets. This is something you guys asked for, and I could never get all the watches together to actually do the review on Watchbox Reviews, so I'm going to talk my way through this one. Uh, that is a great example of one of the best bracelets of the 90s, and I should remind you that Omega makes some of the best bracelets in the world. It was arguably that generation of Seamaster back in the 1990s, the bracelet and the clasp that forced Rolex to rethink their stamped oyster clasps and their hollow link bracelets, which in hindsight, even by the standards of the 90s, felt like tinsel from a tree. I mean, this watch right here is still impressive today. You put that on your wrist, that's my old Omega Seamaster 253180. You put that on your wrist today, it still feels expensive. It still feels like a luxury product, but pre-solid end link, uh, pre-solid center link, pre-milled clasp Rolex watches, you can see why they had to change and why Omega was able to set the pace back in the 90s. I should also mention that the Speedmasters today also have a wonderfully robust bracelet feel. Even when you've got that sort of vintage 1039-1506 look on the latest Moonwatch, the links are smaller than they used to be, and it's a little bit reminiscent. In addition to those vintage bracelet references from Omega's own catalog, it does feel like a steel Rolex president. If such a thing existed, it would look like this. And such a thing does exist, but it's a prototype from the 50s. But the thing is, the Speedmaster bracelets also feel great. Wonderfully built, solid, even in their small link forms, which are a little bit dressy like this, they still feel hewn from solid ingots of steel. Clasp and bracelet, very much like a sports bracelet, even when it wears with the souplesse of a dress bracelet. So modern Omega, Seamasters and Speedmasters both, they're right up there and probably best for the price. I'll also say Rolex. By the way, that right there, one of those Omega Olympic Edition watches that you just saw, very nice piece. And there's going to be a curious collector subset of like Omega Olympic watches from 2020 and 2021 someday. That's going to be its own world vintage as those were such weird out of sequence watches. But I digress. Rolex watches. Look, they were late to the party, but by 2005, with that year's GMT, Rolex was really cooking. Solid end links, solid center links, milled out clasps, folding mechanisms, double locking mechanisms, all of that living up to the expectation you have for Rolex bracelets. If the Ferraris of the 80s with Fiat parts were disappointing, then the Montezemolo Ferraris of the 90s were the Ferraris you imagine, and the Rolex bracelets of the 2000s, again, the Rolex you imagine, the quality, the strength, the detail, the features, the engineering that is surpassing, that lives up to your expectations, and even feels like it's more expensive than it really is. That's what you get with a modern Rolex bracelet, but the deep sea is special among them. You can see there is a double folding system. There is an incremental extension on the deep sea that you can open up and adjust. It's that sawtooth thing that allows you to actually adjust the incremental glide lock while it's still on the wrist. You cannot do that with a Sea Dweller 43 or a Submariner. This one's designed to be adjusted without risk of dropping the watch when you're out in a marine environment. It also has a flip lock extension, meaning it has both plus the on the wrist adjustability. This is Rolex's best clasp and probably the best diving clasp made by anyone at any price. Okay, Carl F. Bucherer. Now admittedly, the bracelet and the clasp provided by a supplier, but I'm including it here because the quality of what you get is impressive regardless of where it comes from. The clasp has a micro adjustment and triggers. The individual links feel remarkably, how to put it, 
devoid of play. There is very little rattle or play in these links, except in the direction they're actually supposed to bend. When you put it on the wrist, the watch, which is substantial at about 44.5 millimeters, feels beautifully counterbalanced by the bracelet. And the more you look at it, the more impressive the details are. So while the watch itself is a wonderful piece, if you've got the wrist for it, the bracelet, relative to what you're paying, feels even better. Now, Audemars Piguet, no surprise here, some of the best bracelets on the market. And I should say, well, AP seems to be finding ways to take money and, and expensive details out of all of its watches in every way imaginable. The bracelets actually feel like they're getting better over the years. And that's whether you're getting a standard Roy Loke like this new for 2020 Flying Tourbillon, their first in a while, I should mention, um, or you're getting something like an offshore, which is bigger and burlier. Here's the thing, while the links are of different size, the quality is the same in both instances. And I should mention that if you get them in ceramic, they're even better, as in steel, it takes about nine to 11 hours to hand finish all of the bracelet links and the clasp of a Royal Oak or an offshore. In ceramic, it takes about 33 hours to make the same finishing steps, which means no corners cut there, and in fact, quite impressive. What you're paying for with these watches increasingly is not the movement inside, though it's impressive, and AP has gone all in-house in just about every watch. Nevertheless, the bracelet is the best part of any Royal Oak, even compared to the case, even compared to the bezel. I have to say that when you put it on the wrist, the thing that makes you just take a look, draw in a breath, and sigh with satisfaction it's the bracelet, an AP with removable links fixed by screws and clasps that are ever more durable and robust really sets the pace here. They feel better than Vacheron, as important and impressive as the Generation 3 overseas is, the APs feel more solid. And compared to what you get on a 5726, a 5712, a 5990, or a 5711, AP definitely is in pole position. Eyes closed, you would pick this one out as the most expensive feeling and solid of the big three, the holy trinity integrated bracelet sports watches. But Vacheron, I do feel like you need to be mentioned here. Not because the bracelets are the most solid, though they're up there, but when you combine all of the features that you get in the Generation 3 overseas, you get a bracelet that is arguably more impressive in total than the solidity of Audemars Piguet or the finishing quality of Patek. So what do you get with an overseas Generation 3 bracelet? Well, for one thing, you get quick releases. The quick release system, which comes with accessory straps, you generally get with steel, leather, and rubber. So you get three different bands when you buy your steel overseas three. You can quickly swap from strap to bracelet and back simply by pulling the set off using a trigger on the underside of the bracelet. Now on the bracelet, Every single link on both sides of the bracelet is removable, which means a lot of money was spent making this thing fully sizable so that you can balance side to side without a lopsided bracelet feel. And if you've got that weird in-between wrist size, Vacheron goes one more step with a 1.5 millimeter micro adjustment in each side of the clasp. And the clasp is a trigger release system. So what you're getting here doesn't feel quite as solid as the bracelet on an offshore, nor is it as beautifully finished in absolute detail as say a 5711, but when you put all of the features together with the solidity that it does have and the finishing quality that it does have, you wind up with what might be the best bracelet by anyone anywhere at any price. And having seen bracelets from the likes of Langa, uh, bracelets from Grubel 4C that have recently been previewed, bracelets by independents like H. Moser, I have to say this holds up against the best of them, price irrespective. I would even go so far as to say the Overseas 3 might have the best sports watch bracelet system ever designed. Now, not on the list. Patek, why? Because removable links are fixed by pins and sleeves. And overall, especially with something like a 5711, I don't feel like the 5711 bracelet is as robust as it should be for the price. The clasp is also aging, which means that between the way the bracelet is put together and the way the clasp is put together, the finishing of the individual links, which is outstanding, can't quite make up the difference to the other two-thirds of the Holy Trinity. Also Breitling, well clasp quality has improved under Georges Kern, and there's now a handy micro-adjust, much like a Rolex a flip lock system, or even a hybrid of flip lock and easy link, if I had to describe it, uh, the Breitling 
bracelets are still let down overall by clasp quality, which is not yet at Rolex and Omega level. And finally, I would say that there are four brands that use bracelets and clasps of similar manufacture. There's a company called Brolioli in Ticino, which is the southern Italian-speaking port of Switzerland, and they make clasps and bracelets for Glasuta Original, as you've probably seen on, for example, the 70s Panorama Date Chrono, or the 70s generally. You've probably seen their clasps and bracelets on the Moser Pioneers. You've seen their clasps and bracelets on the Longa Odysseus, and you've seen their clasps and bracelets on many IWC pilot watches. All of which is to say they're all impressive, but none has the advantage because they all come from the same supplier, and again, the ones I mentioned are just a little bit better overall. So, let's take a look at what you guys are saying right here. Oh boy, this chat box moves fast. It is hard to keep up with you guys. Let me see if I can pull up what you're saying right here. Time Hill, very interesting analysis of the VC bracelet. Always a lot to learn here. We have Jack, good evening, joining us just now. Good evening, Jack. We have Abdullar saying all sports watches should be offered with a rubber, leather, or NATO with the bracelet as standard. I'll go even a little bit further and say quick release systems need to be the norm for the next generation of luxury watches. Right here we have... Air Dam 13, got to talk about the genius of the Tudor Pelagos clasp here. Great piece of engineering. Truly it is. It's got a lot to recommend it. There's a clamshell locking system. There is an elastic extension system. There is a fixed extension system. And then there are several stops where you can actually lock the elastic in place. It is very impressive. And all of it in titanium too. So that probably deserves to be mentioned, but we only have so much time in the show. We have a question about Chapek. I would say Chapek is up there, but again, I, I have experience with the watches, and I would say the ones that I mentioned are probably just a nose ahead, maybe one link ahead, to use a bracelet metaphor. And then we have uh, Shop Le Qatar saying, please, a shout out to Alice from Watchbox Dubai, finally got my first watch from Watchbox, top-notch service, Glasuta Pano Reserve. Thank you for trusting our company. I know that we'll be happy to hear about that at the Dubai office. Shout out to Alice. Very, very cool. We've got friends suggesting Parmigiani, and then a response that Parmigiani Reggiano is a cheese, not a watch. I, I recommend Parmigiani, by the way. I'm not into their non-round watches, but the Torix series, uh, the Torix are awesome, dating back to the earliest days. That was Michel Parmigiani's original case design, and it is still scintillating. And right here, we have a question. Question from Keystar G60. At what price point do you think the use of pin sleeves becomes questionable? I would say because Oris manages to build watches under $3,000 with pin sleeves, I do not accept pin sleeves as a bracelet assembly above $2,500. I think it's easy enough to do it with, with screws, which means that removable links in the bracelet are going to be fixed by screws, not these obtuse pins and sleeves that you need to remove with a block and punch. If you're new to that term, pin sleeves, that's what it means. It means an old 90s style Omega bracelet assembly, which was the only shortfall of those 90s Omega bracelets. And then right here, we have Matt Foster saying, used to have Parmigiani annual calendar, loved it, picked it up used for 35 cents on the dollar. That is one of the things about Parmigiani. It's the watch to buy used because of depreciation. And then right here, Kevin C. Tim, you should do a show on forgotten watch brands that were popular back in the day. You know what? We should absolutely do that. We could have a whole night about, I don't know, Franck Muller and techno time and <laughs> stuff like that from the 1990s, the hottest watches of the 1990s, the Raymond Weil Parsifal. All right, let's talk about viewer wrist shots too. We've got Yit T and his Breitling Navitimer braving a fasting month, staying strong during the day, indoors at the mall. Looking good. I love that dial. Christopher H. of Texas showcases his own Breitling flyer with Cosmonaut and Texas Flowers. We've got Sean B., also of Texas, flying low with his Breitling Navitimer B0143 with rose accents and a coffee cup that I can really embrace. Right there, we've also got Matthew N. of Birmingham, UK, sharing his 2021 Tudor Black Bay 58 925 Sterling Silver. Marvin R. relaxes in Nassau, Bahamas with his Tudor Black Bay GMT. Big Tudor presence on the show tonight. Eddie L. introduces his Omega Seamaster to the sea for the first time. Nice shot. 
Wow, that is a really nice capture, Eddie. Well done. Eddie Landsberg, longtime friend of the show. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, so you want to be a YouTuber part two. Check out what I have to deal with on a daily basis in my inbox. This was a pitch for advertising. Sir, the kindest time of the day, I represent the interests of internet service Tubi. That is, I am directly a member of the Tubi team. We were interested in your channel and the content on YouTube in general, which is why we are writing to you now. Our team would like to order a small ad divertising campaign from you. We have big plans for the beginning of May and an unlimited budget for this very company. If my words have interested you in any way, then I would be happy to talk to you personally. You can contact our team versus WhatsApp, and I'm not giving you free promotion. Sincerely, the Tubi team. And because we mentioned Tubi earlier in the show, this is definitely not Tubi custom exhausts as featured on Ferraris. The things I put up with for you guys, being an internet personality in the public domain. All right. Okay, so 2021 tax returns. They are on the way. In the United States, and granted, bear with me if you're not from the US, but tax day 2021, the day by which we must file our taxes, is May 17th. $3,000 seems a likely tax return for many Americans who are gonna be filing. For some it will be more, for some it will be less, but for our purposes we're going to consider $3,000 a tax return check from the IRS to you. And Uncle Sam is buying you one hell of a watch today. For others, I admit, you're not in the United States, none of this makes sense. Let's just consider today's show theme, the best $3,000 watches to buy. I'm including new and pre-owned, we're taking a look at both. So I should also mention that because tis the season and it's coming up on us, these are all great watches to give as graduation presents. So Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, Eddie, you asked and I answered. This is one of the best watches to buy used. And I say buy the original 1993 to 2006 version, the 253180. The marketplace for these used full box, full papers, service records is right around $3,000, a bit more, a bit less, but you nail it on the head and you get the watch with the bracelet for that price. Why not own one of the most famous movie watches of all time? Granted, I know the one in GoldenEye was the quartz model. Bear with me. The other three Pierce Brosnan appearances were all the chronometer. And more important than Bond, forget him, I own one, which means I can actually endorse this. One of the few times on the show I can actually say, I like it enough to own it, keep it, wear it, and enjoy it. That was my holiday shot that went out on my Christmas card. Also, I should mention that it is still a killer everyday watch. Even though the oldest of these are now almost 30 years old, they're still of such a build and specification that they can be made functional as dive watches. It's not often that I say you can dive with a vintage dive watch. With this watch, parts and service, as well as the original quality of the watch, are such that you can absolutely still wear it, enjoy a 90s tritium fade if you have one of that vintage, and take it swimming without worrying about destroying the movement and the dial because of water intrusion. It's still a gorgeous watch. At 41 millimeters and pancake flat by modern Omega standards, this is a watch that looks good as your sports watch, your casual watch, but also your suit watch and your formal watch. So there's a lot of versatility here, and this is a watch that wears well even on tiny wrists, so I can endorse it for almost anyone and check first, but if you buy it from the watch box, we have a seven day no cost, no questions asked return policy, but I'm gonna call this a unisex option. I've seen it done, I know it works. Also, it has a better bracelet than a 90s Submariner, and we just talked about that. You can see it right there, it's gorgeous. It is aesthetically a bit of a blend of a sports watch and a dress watch bracelet, so it works well. But here's the thing, it is still very solid and impressive and far better than a sub from the same period. A lot of 90s sub bracelets, if they're the original bracelet with the watch, have already worn out and they're too too ropey to wear with any peace of mind. You feel like the watch is gonna fall off. With this, I mean, it's not quite AP, but it's damn close. And it's as good as any AP bracelet feel-wise from the 90s. I'll also say that at 41 millimeters in steel, a chronometer with a diving clasp, with a diving extension, a helium escape valve, this watch sat somewhere between a 90s sub and a 90s sea dweller in capability and it's still formidable today and serviceable locally anywhere in the world which means you don't have to send this one back to Switzerland to service and that is not true of a lot of watches made today so 
Let's see what you guys are saying right here. Dennis, uh, Dennis R.H. saying, I got mine and it's one of the best in my one watch collection. You know what, Dennis? You're totally right there. Mateo C. saying, love mine, 253180. It's like the Marinello from Ferrari, the best of the best. And then right here, we have Karate Chop saying, shout out to the Zin U50. Great bang for the buck. I got to agree. Get it full bracelet. Get it full tegament. No reason to hold back when the pricing is that fair. Edward Ledden saying, hoping to buy a 253180 soon. Believe me, my man, you will not be disappointed. Just decide going in whether you want to get a tritium dial from the 90s or one of the later Luminova dials. Each one has something to recommend it, but you do have a choice right there. And then we have Kevin C. For 3000 a used vintage Hoyer diver, many options from the 1990s. And then right here, we have Terry C. saying, for 3000 I would buy a white gold deployant clasp for my Breguet. Okay, guys, and then right here we have... Jim Millett saying, totally agree about a Wolfgang and Tim video. I would love to make that happen. Wolfgang, get in touch with me. Uh, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We'll find out a way to make that happen. That'll be on the Talking Time with Tim Masso podcast. And by the way, guys, timmasso.com is real. It's a thing. I did it. You can download my podcast there. And I could see right here. We've got Vincent P. saying, hey, Tim, can you give my friend Roy a shout-out? Most indecisive person ever. Roy, you've got to commit. I'm giving you a shout-out. Okay, now let's talk about the Mito Ocean Star Diver Chronometer. How about a Planet Ocean for under $2,000? That's basically what you're getting right here. 43.5 millimeters in stainless steel. You're getting a fold-out diving extension in a diving clasp. You're getting a COSC chronometer movement that has an 80-hour power reserve and an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. It has a helium escape valve. It's a 600-meter diver. All of this, and if we can go full screen with that dial, look what Mito did, guys. A proper conversion from meters to feet. Nope, 600 meters is not 2,000 feet. Mito, thank you for being precise. You guys are Swiss, but in my heart, you'll always be German. Right there, we've also got a watch for which factory service is listed publicly. Damn good of you guys. Drawing the veil on one of the most opaque parts of the watch ownership experience, that's right on their website. Also, one year more warranty than a Patek Nautilus. Patek gives you two. With a COSC certified Mito, you get three. And I should mention, why even bother with an Omega Dive watch at this point when you can buy this thing new for $1,700? do not even bother getting it used. That's a deal right there. If you can negotiate off 10% and it's a Mito, so you should, that's one hell of a machine for the money. Again, new or used, you're getting a buy, but why not get it new with the three-year price, you know, the three-year warranty at that price? I mean, a few links of a Rolex bracelet, and you're right there at that price, 1700 bucks. Mito, you're impressing me. I love what you guys are doing. So, let's talk about Longines. We're hitting a lot of Swatch brands right here, guys, but I promise you it won't all be Swatch Group by the end of the show. The Pulsometer Chronograph. This is a watch that came out in 2015, and when uh, my former colleague, Raphael, who used to help me with the watch listings and posting the videos, he asked me what he should get back in 2016 when he was new to the company. I said this, because this is a watch that looks four times its price. Now, its price was 4,300 bucks, but could I easily mistake that for a Vacheron Les Historiques? You better believe it. This is a watch, 40 millimeters, that is the right size. Stainless steel, still a standout, white lacquer dial that looks bottomless, glossy, and almost like enamel. It has a doctor-style pulsation scale, which is very cool. It's the cooler brother of the tachymeter and the telemeter. Plus, like I said, with the lacquered dial, the blued hands, and the multicolor pulsation scale, it looks really pricey. This is a watch with the caliber 788, which is a hugely modified mono pusher variant of a Valjoux 7750. You're getting a column wheel. You're getting automatic winding. You're getting 54 hours of power reserve and a display case back. This is a really sharp timepiece. And the fact that it comes on alligator standard at what was a retail price of 4300 you expect calfskin or some sort of textile. It is a very impressive looking watch. And I should mention, 
$3,000 here can be negotiated if you want to pick up one of these used. It can absolutely be done. I've seen it done, but $3,500 for one of the best on the market, it's worth overspending a little. I know some of you will have tax returns of more or less than $3,000, but if you've got a splurge on one of these watches, I would say definitely do it with this one because this is a memorable experience and a watch that will look just as good in 100 years. See what you guys are saying right here. Daniel Hill, Omega is awesome. Good to see you. Hope to meet you one day. I hope so. I'm going to be traveling the world once this COVID thing is over. I want to check out Europe, Latin America, the West Coast of the U.S., a couple of different stops in Asia and the Middle East. So let me know if you're interested. Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and maybe the Tim Masso Traveling Circus can touch down in your town. Hey, Traveling Circus, why not the Flying Circus? Okay, right here, we got Showcase Watches saying 41 millimeter SMP 222080 with caliber 2500 is the best Seamaster in my honest opinion. Modern with vintage cues and still bang for the buck. We've also got UC, or Yusuf, I should say, Yusuf 4646 joining in from Bahrain and staying up very late with us from the Gulf. Thank you for staying up late. It might even be early there at this point. And then right here, let's see what you guys are saying right here. Abdul R, I think $3,000 for a Chopard LUC Pro 1. Not impossible but you're going to have to look around. And then right here, Jim Millett saying, get over to the UK, Tim. You know what? I have not been there. I have not formally visited the UK as a watch box dude. And you know what? I think it's time to fly the flag. Let's see what else you guys are saying right here. Time Hill thought that Longines was a Longa. Like I said, it looks really expensive for what it is. If you pick that up for three grand, my man, you did good. And then right here, we've got... Renside saying, great stuff about the pulsimeter. All right, guys, well, I asked and you answered. Viewer wrist shots number three. Joining in with me, it is Wolfgang of Austria, one of our most regular contributors and the liveliest in the box by far. Right here in Tulum, Mexico, night snorkeling with his Seiko. Very cool. Kyle A and Hannibal the dog. Relax with a Panerai Luminor 8-day PAM 560 on a rubber B strap. Lounging. We've got Adam C. of the UK sharing a spectacular loom shot from his new Zenith Pilot Type 20 Extra Special. Well done, Adam. Active member on the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group. And the sociable loner who captures a close hauled shot of his pig dial, Panerai Radiomir PAM 425. And Jimmy Y. and his Rolex share the stage with his Academy of Country Music Award. Very cool. I would love to know the extended story behind this picture. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, right here we've got East of Suez checking in from Okinawa. We've got Mark E. Pass by Qatar, Tim. You know I will. We're already in Dubai and we are looking to expand through the Middle East. And then right here we've got Kevin C. opining Seiko needs to bring back the land monster. Okay, we've got Eric R. Aloha from Southern Utah. A fan of Zinn and its tegmented goodness. All right, we have Daniel Hill asking, Tim, why don't you ever talk about RGM watches? I really should. Maybe I'll do that in the next show. I've met Roland. He's a super cool guy, and I've got an offer from him to go out and actually see the manufacturer in Lancaster. So I'm really just dragging my heels on this. This needs to happen. RGM, we'll give them a shout out in the next show. More 2021 tax return watches, starting with Breitling, a big one, because we're talking about the Aerospace Evo, which is like your Generation 4 Aerospace, or the Generation 3. Both of them can be bought for this price. I don't think it's necessary to go back to the Generation 2 or 1, which are older watches, somewhat more vintage and a bit more fragile. Go with the Generation 3 or the Aerospace Evo. Generation 3, made from 2007 to 2012. The Aerospace Evo, made since 2013. Not a poser or an anachronism, notably for a pilot's watch in the modern era. This is the real thing. Unlike a Rolex GMT or an Omega Speedmaster, this is a watch that was designed with the pilot in mind and designed to be used the way a pilot will use a modern watch. So while yes, NASA still flies with the moon watch, and yes, many pilots still wear Rolex GMTs, this is a different generation. I would even say several generations removed from those watches which have the roots in the 1950s. This watch has its roots in the 1980s. What do you get? 
dual time capability, analog and digital on one dial. You get a 24 hour format if you want it in military time. You get a countdown timer, you get an alarm, you get a chronograph, and you get super quartz precision in a watch that is accurate to 15 seconds a year. Remember, a, a chronometer, mechanical, can lose four seconds or gain six seconds a day. And a standard quartz watch can lose or gain 15 seconds a month. 15 seconds a year, thermocompensated. And I should mention it has an electronic minute repeater and a backlight and a perpetual calendar. All of this in a luxury watch that will last a lifetime. How do I know that? Because we still bring in service and buy the very first aerospace from 1985 and they still work beautifully. I'll also say that if you get the Gen 3, it's a 42 millimeter. If you get the Gen 4, it's a 43 millimeter. They're all in titanium, beautiful on the wrist, more versatile than you think, prices are reasonable used, and you can even score the Evo model on a strap for $3,000 or less. 100 meter water resistance and a unidirectional diving bezel means there is versatility here that you will not find on a standard pilot's watch. They're typically 30 to 60 meters water resistant. This is 100 with the dive bezel. This is a watch that can do anything. But let us propose, perhaps, I'm going to jump straight to Meistersinger because Meistersinger, this is a watch that you never see. I wanted to talk about watches that we never discuss. And this is a great example of an indie that's been around since about 2001, but we just don't talk about them. So let's right the wrong. Starting with the Soltora Meta X. I went to Watch Time New York back in 2019, back when we were still doing Watch Times. Please, Roger Ruger of Watch Time, make Watch Time New York and LA happen again. I'm begging you, I loved those events. But here's the thing, Meistersinger amid Grubel Forcey, Blancpain, Independence, from every neck of the woods, group standbys, everyone I'd ever wanted to see in one place, in one room, in New York, and it was Meistersinger that stood out. The people were absolutely friendly. The watches were superb, and the Meta X 43 millimeters in steel is a jump hour quasi dive watch from a successful German indie now in its 20th year. I should also say that at 13 millimeters thick, it's one of the thinnest dive style watches you'll find. And yes, technically, it doesn't have running seconds, so it's not an ISO dive watch, but for practical purposes, if you want to use this as a backup dive timer, or just a landlocked timer for those of us who stay high and dry. It is a very cool watch. How many jump hour dive watches are there out there? Not many. I'll also say, yes, there's a Salida SW200 or ETA 2A24 inside, but that's not really what this watch is about. The way it's built and the way it tells time is really the draw. It is handsomely built, very solid. It has captive bezel construction like a Zinn with a ceramic bezel insert. The case is built like a tank and finished quite handsomely for the price. This is a German take on sports watches. Several dial variants are available. You can see the price range. And yes, that upper range includes a lovely mesh bracelet that is very cool. Hey guys, maybe you can't get it used for under 3000 on the mesh bracelet. I advocate busting the budget to buy this lovely Stabe manufactured mesh bracelet with the watch. Even if you have to pay above three grand, it's gonna be worth it. And speaking of which, used prices are all over the map, but with the $3,500 retail, pre-owned prices, or heck, maybe even shrewd bargain prices are gonna be less for this rare Meister Singer. Can you get this watch for three grand? You absolutely can. A very neat watch that looks very cool and is anything but generic in a dive watch class where basically everyone is copying Blancpain and Rolex watches from the 50s. Meister Singer does something different. Jumping into the box right here, We've got Jerry K saying, finally able to join live. Love from the Czech Republic. Thank you for staying up late with me in Central Europe. I really appreciate that. And then right here, we have David Detura saying, Meister Singers just don't do it for me. That's okay. They're not for everyone. And then right here, we have Time Stand Still, Submarine Steel. That's all that needs to be said. And then right here, we've got Adam Crossfire saying, I have to add a Meister Singer to my box. Such a cool watch. You know what? Because this is a Tim Masso show, and you know I am as metronomically slavish to routine as Immanuel Kant, I'm going to harp on a favorite right here. You've heard it mentioned before, but I'm bringing it up again because it's great value and it's an awesome watch. We need to speak of the master of them all for under three grand, the Ball Engineer 2 Magneto S. 42 millimeters in steel, but that's not enough. 
It is packed with features. I'm amazed it's only 42 millimeters. On Espanol, what's it got going for it? It is a COSC certified Swiss chronometer. It has Ball's nearly indestructible spring lock system for resisting shocks. It has 15 tubes of tritium on its dial. That's right, this is a modern day tritium dial, 5,000 Gs shock resistant, and 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic like a Milgauss. Look at that dial, explosive, self-activated tritium. Pull it out of a box at night after one year of shielding from the sun, it's still gonna glow. I'll also mention that it has this awesome anti-magnetic mu metal iris that covers the case back. You actually turn the bezel and it will expand or retract to either shield the movement from magnetism or make it visible for your viewing pleasure. And this is a watch that's $3,400 new, now discontinued, which means you're gonna buy it new old stock or used, and used, it sells for around $2,500, and used is how I will buy my own example of this watch quite soon, because few watches in my 6,000 wrist reviews of history have made such an impression as this lovely little ball. So, guys, what do I advocate? I advocate getting a lot for your money. Any of the watches on this show, three grand, or in some cases slightly more, slightly less, but you do not need to spend $90,000 on a watch to have fun. If you've got that kind of money, I still recommend you put those big purchases on hold, buy yourself a $3,000 watch, love it to death, and rediscover the joy of watches. It's not always just about raising the price of your next goal. Sometimes you need to step back and enjoy what this hobby is all about, and that hobby is all about community and variety. So, viewer wrist shots number four, I asked you answered. Peter L. of Southern California impresses with his rare IWC Da Vinci Digital Date Month Perpetual Calendar Flyback Chronograph. Max L. and his Gerard Perigo 2598 Chronograph warm up with a stoked fire pit. Koji of the Philippines goes for a night swim with his Rolex Submariner and family. Marion G and his Rolex Yacht Master do the laundry in good company. That's yours truly on the pad. And then Rye M3 and his BMW M2 competition perfectly complement each other with Rolex Submariner Date Two Tone taking us home in the M2. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Big shout out. Thank you to Sean. He helped with a major technical oversight that I made in the program for the show tonight, and he deserves full recognition. Thanks to all of you. You are the best audience on YouTube. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.